Hey, what's up, Riverview Church? How are you tonight? Hello. Hello, everyone else. How are you tonight? Are you, are you our youth crew as well down there? Hey, it's so good to be together in church once more, and we are just so glad you're here. It really is my privilege to get to welcome you here tonight, whether you're here for the First time or the hundredth time, we are just glad you're here in the room. And of course, a huge welcome as well to the people joining us by live stream. I'm really excited by tonight because tonight is a little bit of a different message. Of course, we are finishing off our My To Be List series, but this is also session six of Summer Camp. And so you might not have known as you came in tonight that you were going to be a part of session six of Summer Camp, but you are in for an absolute treat. How good are our young people, right? Church, older people that are older than 18. Can you put your hands together for our young people? We love you guys. So I wanted to just invite you a little bit in on the journey of what's been happening over the last couple of days with our young people. And throughout summer camp, we have been exploring this idea of what it looks like to live fully surrendered to Jesus, withholding nothing. And so over the past couple of days, we have created many spaces. We've spoken many words in which would encourage our people to live the surrendered life. And man, I think it's a beautiful thing because over the last couple of days, I've seen his joy, I've seen his peace, I've seen his love, I've seen his grace overflow in this community of young people. And something about that has inspired me and something about that has encouraged me. And I don't know if you've maybe hung out with young people before, but there's something about their life, there's something about their energy which brings life to your soul. And that is why tonight I want to speak a message that is actually inspired by this amazing group of young people. And if you haven't been here throughout our, our January series, we've been talking about my to-be list. Because we all know in January, often we have a, a huge list of things that we want to do and achieve. But we thought it would be worthwhile talking about the people that we want to become. And so I, I got thinking about that. And I got thinking about that in relation to these young people. And I spent some time in prayer thinking, God, what is it even in my life that you want me to become? What would you, what, what do you want me to be? And the answer was something that I wasn't expecting. I had this overwhelming sense that I want to be new. I want to be renewed. I want to be refreshed. I want to live with a sense of new revelation a sense of new vision, a sense of new direction. I don't want to be old. Now, there's nothing wrong with being old, but I want to be new. And the reality is, this series is about who you are going to become. And that's all well and good, but friends, I don't want to just become someone and finish. I want to be constantly being made new. I want to be constantly improving and growing and becoming something larger than I already am. So if you're taking notes, I, and I encourage you to do so, our young people have their notes pads, so I'm expecting you all to pull them out. Thank you. If you're taking notes, the title of this message is New You. You know, you've heard it, New Year, New You. We're going there tonight. So I thought I would start our time together by just opening up the Word of God and letting it speak. And so tonight, we're actually going to start by reading three passages of Scripture together. And we're going to start by reading from Luke 5, and then we're going to read from Isaiah, and then from 2 Corinthians. But I thought because it's session 6 of summer camp, I thought we'd get some of our young people up here to read the passages for us. So why don't you welcome up Elias, Abina, and Eric. These are some of our amazing youth. And they're going to read from us. Elias, why don't you take it away with Luke 5. We're going to be reading Luke 5, verses 36 to 38. He told them this parable, no one tears a piece out of a new garment to patch an old one, otherwise they will have to tore to, the new garment and the patch from the new one will not match the old one. No one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the new one will burst the skins, the wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No, new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. 
now it springs up, do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. 2 Corinthians 5. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. Awesome. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the revelation it brings to our lives. And we just pray that as we gather around it tonight, God, would you be speaking to us in a new way? Lord, don't, us allow us, don't allow us just to sit through this message assuming it's for somebody else, but let us open our hearts ready to receive what it is you have to say. We pray that you would speak to us in a powerful way. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Why don't you put your hands together for these amazing young people. So good. Hey, I want you just for a moment to think a little bit about the best present you've ever received, the best gift you ever received. I remember probably up there with the best gifts I've ever received was a brand new mobile phone. Now, uh, for many years, I had one of those Nokia brick phones. It was like gold, but not real gold. It was like, ugh. It was massive. It, it made my bag look bigger because it stuck out of my bag. But I remember, I don't know if it was for my birthday or Christmas. I actually can't remember what it was for, but my parents wrapped up this new phone for me. And I was so excited because it was the Motorola Razor. Hallelujah. This was the phone that Jack Bauer himself used. And man, I, you know, you could do the, like, the flip out of the phone. The problem is when I was about 15, I didn't have many phone calls coming in, so I didn't get to do that all that often. But I remember just being so excited for this gift. My parents gave me this. I was overjoyed by this gift. Now, I was overjoyed, I think, for two reasons. First, because it was brand new. When I was younger, I didn't get a huge amount of stuff that was brand new because I was the youngest of three boys, lots of hand-me-downs. I got this phone like fresh out of the box. You know that unboxing thing? Like you peel the plastic off, you slide it out, and it makes like a nice, slow, oh, it was brand new. This phone was brand new. Now, not only was it brand new, when I received it, this phone was like new on the market. It wasn't just brand new. This was like new to everyone. This had just come out. This is the latest piece of technology. And from my memory, all of the best gifts I have ever received are new, new gifts. They're new out of the box, and they're new on the market because they're the latest craze. Now, Renee and I more recently have been venturing into the old new gifts, you know what I'm saying? So to save a little bit of money or to recycle, we'll get a second hand. It's been used before. It's old. But it's a new product. So like just a couple of weeks ago, I got a brand new Ryobi drill that had been used, and I got it for like half the price. Hallelujah. Old new is not bad. Now, new old, nah, pretty average. New old, we're talking about the thing that is brand new to you, but it's an old piece of technology. Mm. No, thank you. You know, you go and get your iPhone 5 SE. I don't know if they still sell them. And you get it out of the box, and it's like, yeah, this is exciting, but it's not, it's not the newest one. You know, new old's not, not quite as good. And then, friends, old, old. <laughs> no one wants old, old. Old, old is, look, it's old technology. It's secondhand. You know, you don't really want old, old. And I love the idea that as much as I could... In my life, I wanted to receive new, new. And I think you all understand whether you had a mobile phone and you had an experience like that, there's something different about new. There's something different about new. I don't know how often you throw yourself in new situations or meet new people or, or try new things, but the reality is with new, it's inconvenient, right? I don't know about you, but I don't sometimes like meeting new people just because it's uncomfortable. I'm a pastor here. Am I allowed to say that? <laughs> How many times do you try new things, right? Like when you go to a restaurant, do you get a new thing or do you get the same thing you always get? Same thing. There you go. Because the reality is new is uncomfortable. New is unfamiliar. New is uncharted territory. But the, crea the crazy reality is that Jesus invites us to step in, not just to new, but to new, new. 2 Corinthians 4, the Apostle Paul, talking about this daily reality, he says, therefore we do not lose heart. He's talking about a tough time in his life. Though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are being made new. We are being renewed day by day. You see, the purpose of this series, My To Be List, is not to get you to an end point, 
in which you just stay stagnant. But it's actually a catalyst for progress. It's a catalyst for you to become made new again and again and again, because that is the life that Christ is calling us to. You see, we read earlier that those who are found in Christ, Eric read it wonderfully, those who are found in Christ, those who surrender to his lordship, those who place their faith and their trust and their allegiance in Jesus, those people are made into new creation. There's something crazy about that. Now, I don't know about you, but that's exciting for me. If I'm found in Christ, I am a new creation. But you see, when Jesus says that you are a new creation, and if you're found in Him, you are a new creation, when He says that, He doesn't mean, hey, you're a new creation, but next week you're going to get old. The new He is talking about is not a a, a one-week period or a time-based thing. The new is something that continually renews. Are you with me? So when Christ says you are a new creation, friends, I've, I've used this analogy before, he invites us to step into the reality, to become in experience what he says about us. So he says you're a new creation. Now he says be made new again and again and again. Stay new creation. And the invitation stands for everyone in this room today. And what an invitation it is to place your faith, to place your trust, to place your allegiance in Jesus and to be made new. And that's an exciting reality. And and I can't think of anyone who wouldn't want that. But the challenge, as I mentioned earlier, is that it's uncomfortable, right? New is uncomfortable. In fact, in all his wisdom, Jesus, speaking of the kingdom of God, says you need to be born again. Now, I can't think of anything more uncomfortable. I mean, we kind of say that around church, like born again. But can you think about that? That's an uncomfortable picture. Jesus is calling us to something crazy new, something that is uncomfortable, something that is out of our sphere of understanding because he wants us to experience the new. We read something earlier, Elias read Luke 5, and I love this passage. I'd love to touch on it again Jesus speaking, he says, no one pours new wine into old wineskins. Otherwise, the new wine will burst the skins. The wine will run out and the wineskins will be ruined. No new wine must be poured into new wineskins. Now, what is Jesus talking about, right? Like we live in Perth in 2020. I don't hang out with wineskins all that often. Well, Jesus is making a similar point to the one he made about being born again. Essentially, what he's saying is that we need a new way of thinking. We need a new way of living. We need a new way of understanding the world in order to capture the new wine that he wants to drop into our lives. Now, what is the new wine? The new wine in the Old Testament was often often referenced in relation to the promised land. The land in which God reigned. The land in which his blessing overflowed. The land in which his power reigned. So when Jesus says, you need a new wineskin to contain this new wine, well, that wineskin needs to be expanding. I don't want to have an old one. I want to have a new one in order that I can contain and receive and understand and, and, and gain access to the realities of God. And as I said, the, the challenge is it's uncomfortable, right? Like, I love to categorize my life. Like, the way I see the world is, is, is in categories, I've got a category for this, I've got a category for that. But what Jesus is asking us to do is throw all of that away because he's gonna show us a new category, right? So when you have a new wine skin, the amazing thing is when wine is poured into it, it enlarges, it expands, it increases in size. And what Jesus is wanting to do with us is to pour new wine into our lives. The problem is if we come to him with an old mindset, if we come to him with old expectations, we actually cannot receive and hold the new wine in which he wants to pour out. I love this interaction that takes place in the scriptures. And John the Baptist, who declares, uh, who Jesus declares as the, the greatest man born of women. Now, that's a great compliment. So he's a pretty good guy. This, this guy's like top level. And he's sitting in prison and he's doubting. He's worried. He's a little unsure because so far 
things haven't quite gone to plan, right? Things haven't quite gone, and, and things haven't landed in the categories in which he thought they would. And so he sends messengers from prison to Jesus. And the messengers arrive at Jesus and they say, are you the one who is to come? Or should we expect someone else? And Jesus' reply is amazing. He says in Luke 7, so he replied to the messengers, go back and report to John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight, the lame walk, those who have leprosy are clean, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the good news is proclaimed to the poor. In other words, new wine is being poured out. And then he says something crazy. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. What's happening in this passage? Well, John is having a moment in which his wineskin is breaking because the new wine. Because for John, he was expecting the Messiah to play a certain role, to do a certain thing, to look a certain way. And then Jesus rolls up and things are different. And Jesus rolls up and he begins pouring out new wine. But for John, he can't conceive it because it doesn't look like he thought it would look. It's outside the box. It's outside his realm of capability and possibility. But Jesus says new wine is being poured out. John, it's time for a new wineskin. You see, for me personally... I face this reality all the time. Like I'll see a a video that another church posts and someone is radically healed. And inside of me, there's this awful cynicism that comes out that goes, oh, that can't be God. Surely there's something up with that. And that is an old wineskin. You see, I felt God the other day speaking to me and this was like a slap across the head. I felt God say to me, Ryan, Because often when something was happening in the room and I was uncomfortable with it, I'd be like, well, it's probably not God, actually. This is not God. And I felt him say to me, Ryan, do you really think I'm only going to manifest my power up to the limits of your comfort? Like, God is the creator of the universe, He wants to pour out new wine. He wants to pour out his power, his love, his grace, his mercy. And I'm sitting there going, "Mm, probably not him because I'm a little uncomfortable. What he's calling me to is to receive a new wineskin, receive a new way of thinking, a new way of perceiving, a new way of understanding in order that I would be able to receive the new wine in which he's pouring out. And what I would love to do with the rest of our time together is just spend a couple of moments talking about three things, three things that are the fruit of life in the new creation, three things that you will see in your life. Now, we don't aim at these things, but these are beautiful fruit of people who are being made new. These are beautiful fruit of people who are receiving again and again a new wineskin in order that they can contain what God is doing. And can I just say, as the generations pastor here at Riverview, I am so proud and I'm so thrilled that these pieces of fruit that I'm going to talk about are things that I've seen again and again at summer camp this week. And that is so exciting for me because I know that God is doing something new in these young people. And so we're going to lean in just for a couple of moments about three pieces of fruit that come from new creation. Are you ready? Number one, turn to your neighbor and say number one, a new faith. You see, when you are being made new by God again and again, when you are being renewed day by day, as Paul says, the beautiful fruit that comes from your life is a new faith a sense of trust and dependence upon God. You see, new Christians are probably the most faith-filled people I ever meet. They come in, maybe they're not tainted, maybe they don't have an old wineskin, they walk in, and man, they believe what the Bible says. They get to church early. They're ready to worship, they're faith-filled, they're, they're so excited just to be following Him. And why is that? I think it's because they're new. But if we are renewed day by day, we will be constantly receiving new faith. We'll be constantly walking in expectant for God to do something that maybe is outside of our regular old wineskin. You know, that's why I I love 
summer camps is because it's such a great opportunity for new, right? These young people are thrown into dorms with people that they don't, haven't met, not actually thrown into dorms. But it's, it's a whole new experience for many of our young people. And you know what? Some of the most amazing relationships are formed. Some of the gr- most like, amazing God moments are felt. Like for many of you in the room that maybe are older than 18, you once went on a camp in which everything was new and uncomfortable, but God did some foundational work in you. Your faith was increased. Your faith was stirred up. So renewal, being people who are new creation, Stepping into this new creation leads to new faith. Number two, the fruit of new creation, I love this because I'm a Star Wars fan, leads to a new hope. The Star Wars nerds all laughed in unison. You see, as you have your heart and your mind transformed and renewed by the realities of God, not with your old wineskin, but with your new wineskin, in order that you're able to receive all that He has, man, your hope is strengthened and deepened because you understand the realities of what God is doing are far bigger than yourself. You see, we serve a redeeming God. He is so good. He is able to, to turn evil into good. He's able to take people from dark situations and bring them into life. He's able to bring beauty from ashes. And man, when you spend time in the presence of that amazing God, when you are constantly renewed day by day, man, you live with a new hope. I've seen Christians walk through the worst of situations and maintain hope, joy, peace, love, patience. You know the song. Man, He builds into us a new hope. We don't look with our heads down because He is doing something new. Do you perceive it? And lastly, and followers of Jesus would know this to be true, as we step into new creation, as we have our old wineskins replaced with new ones, we receive a new life, a new life. And it might sound obvious, but the reality is Jesus has come in order that we can have life. I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we treat Jesus just as a teacher. You know, he's bringing a great new way of living, a good standard. But Jesus came in order that we can have life. Now, not just life here, but life eternal. He says in John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I have come that they may have life. Friends, that is the most amazing gift of all. That as we step into relationship with Jesus, as we become a new creation, we receive a new life. We receive new purpose, new meaning, new fulfillment, new direction. But not only do we receive that in the here and now, man, we receive life eternal. Something beyond just the here and now. And, and, and friends, that leads us back to new hope. You see, so often I have conversations with some great people who are on the fringes of church and they'll often say something along the lines of, but, but like, why do I need Jesus? You know, like I, I live a good life. I'm faithful to my wife. I love my kids. I enjoy my work. I pay my taxes. Why do I need Jesus? Why do I need Jesus? You know, it really got me thinking. And it reminded me that at the centrality of the message of Jesus' life was not just good teaching, was not just how to be good. It was life. Why do I need Jesus? Because He gives you life. You see, one day, each and every one of us are going to have to go through the doorway of death. And that's a scary reality. But in Jesus, you find life. Jesus is the gate through that reality, not just to life now, but life eternal. And friends, that is the greatest gift of all. And the invitation stands for each and every one of us to respond to that new life. 
You see, Jesus is calling each and every one of us, and we've said this again and again to our young people. Jesus is calling us, come, follow me. The question is, will we surrender our old wineskin? Will we surrender our old way of living and perceiving? But friends, He wants to do something new. And I just wonder, like we read in Isaiah, can we perceive it? Are we so comfortable with the categories we've put God in? Or are we willing to be made new again and again in order that we would receive the fullness of God? Step in truly to new creations.